I'm struggling. Just needed to turn it on. Okay, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together once again to reflect upon the mystery of the sacrament of sacraments, the most holy Eucharist. Give us the faith we need to fully embrace the reality that your Son is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, and that the Mass is not only a sacred meal, but also a sacrifice. And we ask the Mother of the Eucharist for her intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so as I was pondering, as, as it was somewhat providential that I could not be here last week because um, I had prepared, and then I didn't really like what I prepared, and so then when I got back to, you know, I thought I'd have more energy later in the week, and so I really didn't, and so it was now Saturday afternoon. I go, I got to start thinking about what I'm going to talk about on Monday night, and I looked at my notes, and they didn't make any sense to me, because uh, I kind of forgotten, you know, that they made sense as I was getting the, the talk organized, but so I went back and started to reread it, and all of a sudden I began to see things in a different light. Um, I think I began to understand some of the logic uh, that's kind of, you know, you think about a river, a river has the current on the top, and you have the current on the bottom. I think I began to understand some of the, the, the more elemental or fundamental ideas that Bishop Barron is trying to communicate. Um, so that was beneficial. Um, but while I'm thinking about that, that also means my intention, if you got my email, my intention was to talk tonight and then tomorrow do the, the fourth talk privately at, at, at home. Um, but that's not going to work because I, I haven't even thought about preparing for the fourth talk because... I didn't get uh, as much energy back as I would at, at the time where I hoped. That makes sense. So either later this week or probably sometimes next week, I'll do that final recording, and then we'll put it up on YouTube and Spotify, and then Katie or I will send out an email with all the links. So you'll have the last talk, which will be the, the, uh, the talk of, uh, of the third chapter on the real presence. So anyway, as I was thinking about tonight, and as I was getting ready for it, I was you know, rereading it, I began to see... Um, some connections with the idea of sacrifice uh, from another book I had read. Um, my old professor of mine on the Eucharist, uh, and in which he had a whole chapter on primitive religion and the idea of sacrifice in primitive religion. And I think this is important to start there because we are modern and we don't have any concept of sacrifice. And no, it doesn't, it doesn't really cross our mind. When I think about sacrifice, I think in, in terms for us, we think of it either in more of a positive way, like if I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I have to do certain things, like not sit on my couch and eat pizza and drink beer. If I do that, I'm not going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I have to sacrifice certain things in order to achieve something. And that's certainly true. But that's not really religious sacrifice, the idea of sacrificing an animal. Uh, sacrificing grain. Uh, we don't do these things, and there's reasons why we don't. One is because we're Christians, and Christ is the final sacrifice, the sacrifice, and so we've moved away from that. Second, we're, we're modern, uh, and so this idea of, of religious sacrifice is foreign to us, where, say, it wouldn't have been foreign to, say, someone in the Middle Ages, because uh, the idea of sacrifice was much more um, part of their religious worldview. Um, also, we live in a Protestant country, not a Catholic country, and so Protestantism generally has kind of, uh, I'm going to say squash, but maybe whitewash the idea of sacrifice. Um, and so I think it's a good idea just to kind of take a step back and think about what sacrifice meant for just religion in general as we, before we get into what it means for the Jews and what it meant for the Christians and what it means for us in the Mass. And as I was reflecting upon that and thinking about that, I think there are two words or two ideas that I want everyone here to keep in mind as we go forward. And one idea is the exterior action. Exterior actions. And the other idea is interior attitude. 
And this is the struggle uh, when it comes to sacrifice. When it comes to, um, well, this is a complaint or an objection Protestants have with Catholics. That you just go through the motions. It's works-based. If you go to Mass, you do these things, you check off the list, and then you go to heaven. Don't eat meat on Fridays, don't do this, don't do this. And so it's a very much about, the, Protestants can see um, the Catholic uh, forms of prayer, forms of, of ex, these exterior actions, only from an exterior point of view. They don't necessarily understand the interior realities. And as Catholics, we fall into that too. You know, we fall into, okay, I've, I've done my duty. I, I, have, I didn't eat meat on Friday. I fasted on Good, on good Friday. Check, 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 check. And um, I won't eat meat on Friday, but I'm going to go have a fine lobster dinner, right? And it totally misses the whole idea of the interior reality that we need to have. So this is the, this is the dilemma, the di- dialectic between exterior realities and interior uh, dispositions. So if you go back to the ancient primitive man, primitive religions, um, they had two ideas. When it came to sacrifice, they had two ideas. One was to give thanks or petition, and the other one was to offer some type of uh, sacrifice for the sake of reconciliation. I'm guilty of doing something. I have to reconcile with the sacred. And I'm going to use the words of the sacred right now because I don't want to get into the deed, uh, ideas of gods and all that kind of stuff. Just the idea of there's a, they understood there was a sacred reality, and that they needed to petition it in some way. And so, like the hunters, think about this, this is very interesting. When the hunters would go out and they would hunt, they would, they would finally get their animal, right? Because this was not an easy chore. And they would, they would you know, begin to get ready, prepare the animal for meal, a meal. They would choose certain things to sacrifice to the sacred, to offer to the sacred. And generally speaking, we don't know a lot, but we have enough to, to make some general ideas. What would they choose? What body parts would they choose to offer to the sacred? It was usually the head, the brain, the spine, and the heart. Why? That's life. It's life. It's where life comes from. And in fact, in primitive religions, to eat the heart would be to consume the life of the animal. So now you have, so you're a primitive person. You've, you've just, you know, you killed the, uh, the, um, Buffalo, whatever it is, and now you have the heart, and you have a choice. Do I consume the life, take it for myself, or do I offer it to the sacred? It's the idea of life for life, that it's from the gods that we receive life, therefore we have to offer the life back to the gods. So there's an element of, of understanding that life is precious, it comes from something else outside of me, and when I and, and when I have something of, of an animal which I can consume and can feed my family and my tribe, I now have to offer the life of this animal back to the gods as a form of thanksgiving, or back to the sacred as a form of thanksgiving, or petition, right? If, 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 if we live in, you know, we understand weather patterns, but you think about, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, rain and wind and tornadoes and hurricanes, you know, the gods are angry with us, and so we have to offer... Uh, a sacrifice, petitions to, to keep us safe because we're at the mercy of these things, um, of these realities. So that was like, that, that's one area. The other area was that has to do with, with, with the guilty person. I'm guilty, now I have to make amends. I can make amends with the community, but I also have to make amends with the sacred, the, 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 the God who I, whom I offended. And so we have different you know, stories. Like in one, in one uh, tribe from ancient Malaysia, a, a Malaysian tribe, they would, for some reason, they would cut right below their kneecap, and they would, they would fill a cup up with blood. I don't know why it was below the kneecap, but that's what it was. And then they would mix that blood with water, and then they would, as they confessed their sins, they would throw the blood into the air as a form of like, you know, I'm giving myself to the gods as I confess my sins. So there's a, a sense of I, I owe something of my own self to make appeasement, okay? Or um, if an animal was used, part of that ritual uh, of the sacrifice of the animal for the sake of my own sinfulness, part of that ritual was a, uh, was a, a moment in which the animal or the, the person was able to 
to kind of connect himself or herself to the animal. Because just killing the animal means nothing. But there, part of that idea is that this animal now is taking upon itself my guilt. And I, if I can do that, then the animal can, can be sacrificed for the sake of appeasing my guilt. So this idea of offering praise, praise to God or to the gods, petition to the sacred, offering life for life, you give us life, we're giving our thanks back to you, the idea of expiation for my sins was all part of ancient religions. Okay? However, when we started having agriculture come about, um, the, the idea changed. It went from having animals to now you're sacrificing uh, crop. But part of that, we start, see, we start seeing in people who study this stuff, they start seeing a distortion of sacrifice. Because when it comes to the crops, what you have is, is fertility. You plant seed into the ground, and it grows. And it doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to, to figure out there's going to be connections with fertility, not just fertility with the ground, but also with human fertility. And once you start moving into human fertility, you start moving into sexuality. And then what happened is when you get into sexuality, you start having the idea of dominance and power. It's part of human culture, human history. Sex means dominance. Sex means power. Suddenly, sacrifice is now about power because it's all connected to sexuality and fertility. And there was a distortion that happened. So now sacrifice becomes that which controls the gods. So you get into the idea of human sacrifice with the Mayans, or child sacrifice to Molech. This is what the ancient Hebrews had to deal with. Why did they do that? Because they had this idea of sacrifice. I can control the gods by the power of the sacrifice. If I sacrifice a chicken or I sacrifice a human being, that gives me lesser or greater power over the gods. I can control. It becomes one of dominance. So what we see even in primitive religions is you have this exterior attitude, ex exterior realities filled with an interior attitude. And they're, they're playing this. And so the purity of this religious idea of sacrifice, um, of giving to God life for life, um, I committed a sin, I need to have expiation, has now been deformed and devalued into simply an exterior uh, action in which I can control or manipulate the gods to do what I want. And we're going to see this tension played out in ancient Israel because to understand primitive sacrifice, we have to understand that to understand what Israel is doing. Because Israel is part of a culture part of a tradition, they were not the only people offering sacrifice. They were not the only um, uh, religion that offered sacrifice. Every religion at that moment in time offered sacrifice. But as we begin to understand this, this idea of sacrifice, when we get into the story of Israel, which begins with Abraham, we start seeing some really interesting things that I think Bishop Barron begins to pick up you know, and, and pull out of the context uh, of this. And um, so the first one is that when we move from primitive religions, natural religions, whatever you want to call it, to the Old Testament, to the God of Abraham, what is the fundamental difference between all the other religions and Abraham's religion? One God. That's, that's one part of it. There's something about this God which makes him unique among all the other gods. He spoke to Abraham. He revealed himself to Abraham. So in all the other religions, it was we got to figure out a way to make appeasement to God. But when God speaks to Abraham, sacrifice, the idea of sacrifice, what to sacrifice, how to sacrifice, is no longer a guessing game. It's now, here's what I want. And so God is giving us, he gives us the, the paradigm, right? He gives us the, the, the what to do, because in, do, in doing certain things, we're then able to then cultivate our hearts and change our hearts toward it. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say here? So the exterior attitude of sacrifice, because it's revealed by God, becomes a means of inward change of inward uh, reality. And then we'll see as we go throughout, this tension is the Lord is more focused 
on our interior dispositions than what we do exteriorly. And in fact, we'll see a passage from Isaiah where they're doing all the exterior things right. Where, where are they failing at? Inside. Inside. So this tension between exterior action and, and interior reality needs to be kind of thought about as we go forward because sacrifice requires us to give up that which we hold true, which, that which we desire for the sake of God because we were trying to change our inward reality, our inward disposition. That's all what it's about. It's what Barron says. Did I get my copy? No, here's my copy. Turn to page 36, if you will. <clears throat> page 36. It's the first two sentences of the chapter. An elemental biblical truth is that in a world gone wrong, there is no communion without sacrifice. Since the world has been twisted out of shape, it can be straightened out. It can be straightened only through a painful process of reconfiguration. So this idea that we had to get to the, the mystery of sin, that we are, we are somehow twisted and wounded and our desires are not focused on the proper desire. And that in order for us to begin to desire correctly, there has to be a moment of a, a sacrifice is part of, uh, of what we need to twist us back out of shape, but twist us into shape. And that requires, um, it requires sacrifice. But a sacrifice that begins inside interiorly. And we see this with Abraham. So the call of Abraham. So I'm going to go back and forth. I think this is the last time I'm going to pick up Barrett until the very end. So if you have your notes with me, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And we're going to start with the call of Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I, uh, that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse, and by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. Now, Abraham lived around the year 2000 B.C. He lived in the Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, which is a little bit south of modern-day Baghdad, approximately where, where we think it is. And um, so he, he was surrounded by pagan religions that offered sacrifice. And yet, what we see from the very moment, and Bishop Barron brings this up, is that Abraham is called to sacrifice himself. You are, he's 75 years old. He's probably, uh, he's not just, it's him and his, and his wife Sarai is 65, she's 65. They probably have, a, he's probably something of a very wealthy individual, and that's from later on in Genesis, we'll get, we won't get into that now. Um, but he's probably very wealthy. So he was being uprooted at 75 to go to a land he had never been to. A land, well, that the Lord would show and so he was called from the very moment to sacrifice not an animal, not a crop, but his own life. Uh, it goes back, to, and, and Barron says this beautifully, because if you were at my class in the, in the summer, we talked about spirituality. We talked about was, was the original sin. It was pride that leads to disobedience. And Barron says it, everything went wrong with a disobedient act, and therefore, everything has to be cut, put, put straight with an obedient act. And the first obedient act in this series of obedient acts is the act of Abraham, that he's willing to sacrifice himself. Um, and this internal reality uh, uh, of sacrifice, it's, he's the father of the faith because he has to, or we call him the father of faith, because he did what is so crazily, you know, he just went uh, and, and, and left and followed the Lord into unknown lands. Um, also, a real quick point. One idea that Bishop Barron talks about is the loop of grace. If you, if you read the chapter, he brings up the idea of the loop of grace a lot. This is the loop of grace right here, is that God asks, and if we obey, he gives us grace. But it's not like 
God saying, hey, I got this great gift for you, and I'm just going to, you know, kind of like when I start teasing my dog, which draws my daughter nuts, it's like I had the treat, and I start pulling it away from her, and she uses it more and more, and God's not doing that. It's not like there's some reward that has nothing to do with who I am. He's just kind of offering, but rather the reward he wants to give requires a change of my heart. It requires a change of my attitude. It requires me to sacrifice certain ideas, desires, uh, choices in order, to re- re- in order to obey. And so when I, when I sacrifice those, my own distorted, selfish desires, which I don't necessarily understand they're selfish, right? Unless I step back and think about it. Or I don't necessarily understand they're sinful unless I step back and think about it. But I have to put those away and when I do that, then the Lord, it opens up a space within me that allows him to give the grace that he wants to give to make me the person he's calling me to become. So we have this loop of grace between obedience and reward. And the reward is not something exterior to us, but it's something absolutely essential to the person that the Lord wants us to be. There's a French writer named Leon Blois, or Blois, I don't know how to pronounce it, B-L-O-Y. Anyone know French? Blois? Blois. Blois? Whatever. Blois. Anyway, <laughs> he has a book called The Woman of the Pharisees, I think, or The Woman of the Poor, something like that. But anyway, the last line in the book is the greatest tragedy of, tragedy of all is not to become a saint. And so what, what does that require to become a saint? It requires self-sacrifice. I'm putting away my own desires so I can do what the Lord's asking me to do. And if I do what the Lord asks me to do, then he's going to fill me with the, um, the, the graces I need to become the person to make me truly happy. Having true fulfillment in this life and in the next life. And we see it over and over. I just noticed Lori sitting over there, and I watched her, her interview, and I thought one of the most beautiful um, aspects of her interview was that a certain hesitation to go to adoration then a certain hesitation to go at a certain time, then a certain hesitation to go a little bit longer, but every time she said yes to that hesitation, it got more and more profound. The experience got more and more profound and more and more meaningful. And that's what it, this is what the loop of grace is all about, having to sacrifice something in order to receive the gift of what the Lord wants to give us. Um, so at the very beginning of the Judeo-Christian Religion, at the very, very beginning, it doesn't begin with a sacrifice of an animal or a sacrifice of a crop. It begins with the sacrifice of a person that he has to choose to, to leave his home and to go to um, the land that the Lord would show him. And then about a, over, over 25 years later, so he was 75 when this call happened, and then he was 100 when his son Isaac was born. Uh, and now we have Genesis chapter 22. And it doesn't tell us how old Abraham is, but we can make a guess based upon uh, a couple features in this story. So this is the sacrifice of Abraham. If you go to, um, uh, if you go to Easter Vigil Mass, it's said every Easter Vigil Mass. And, and here's the story. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder in worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire and the knife in his hand. And they they both went, so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, 
my son. So they both so they went both of them together. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So a couple things. First of all, why do we think that this took place several years after the birth of Isaac? Anyone want to venture a guess? Many years. Isaac's language, yes. He's able to talk, so he's a certain age. He's also able to do something else. Oh. He carried the wood. Carried the wood. It's, that takes that it's a, that's a strike. And then, you know, he didn't fight with them. But, if, you know, if, so according to Jewish tradition, Isaac was 33 years old when this happened. According to, well, according to, we don't know. It doesn't say According to Jewish tradition, which means, let's say he was 33, he could certainly take out his old man, right? You know, his 133-year-old father, if he didn't want to do with this. This is why the Jews will call this passage the sacrifice of Isaac. It's Isaac himself who's being sacrificed. I mean, he himself is accepting this sacrifice. So it's a, it's a sacrifice in two ways. One, Abraham is the one who's sacrificing Isaac. Second, Isaac is letting himself be sacrificed by his father. So it's a, it's a, it's, it, it works on two levels. So keep that in the back of your mind, because if you read this, I mean, there's a couple of things. The sun carries the wood up the hill. There's three days. There's two people, right? There's the father and the son. What does this remind you of? Calvary. Now, now anyway, actually, let's put a little, just a little bit finer point on that. Moriah, Mount Moriah. Where is Mount Moriah? Well, it's where Jerusalem is built. Yeah. So you actually have um, the land of Moriah, this mountain. Uh, tradition has it, and it goes from Genesis, also in First, Corinth, uh, First Chronicles, I think it is. One of the Chronicles, First or Second Chronicles, identifies the hill or the mountain upon which Jerusalem is built as Moriah. So there's a connection now between the sacrifice of Isaac and the Jewish temple where all the sacrifices were being sacrificed and the crucifixion of Christ, the only begotten son of the father who, lays, who carries the wood up the hill and voluntarily lays down his life the same way Isaac did. So you start having all these, these connections here. For us, for what we keep in our mind, is that for the ancient Jews, Every sacrifice they, they, ever, they ever did in the temple in Jerusalem was somehow participated in the primal sacrifice of Isaac. That, that it was a continuation, somehow as an experience into that. They saw that as, as a way to carry that out. In other words, for the ancient Jews, the, the only sacrifice that mattered was the sacrifice of Isaac. And every other sacrifice participated in that. That is somewhat kind of reminiscent of what Catholics believe 
about the Mass and that the only sacrifice that matters is that of Christ, and every Mass is, brings that sacrifice present. The difference is, is that we believe in a sacramental reality, and they had more of a, a we'll get into the, the distinction here, but it was called amnesis. It has to do with remembrance. Um, but it ties in. It, is, uh, it ties in. Um, so you have Isaac carrying, carrying the, the, the wood. You have the idea of your son, your only son. Um, but here's the hmm? only, beloved. only beloved son. But here's a real key thing. This is the first, this is not the, uh, well, there's, there's an episode in Genesis 15 where, uh, where Abraham sacrifices animals. But this is at the second, second time that I, I'm aware of, off the top of my head, uh, where Abraham offers sacrifice. And he's now having to sacrifice his son. But what's unique here is that Isaac is the promise of the covenant. In other words, God revealed himself to Abraham and said, if you do what I ask you to do, you're going to have an heir. He was 75 years old. His wife was 65. This is not the, the time of childbirth. And it, it didn't happen like the next nine months. It was 25 years later when he was 100 and, Abraham, and, and Sarah, Sarah was 90. That's when she gave birth. So he had to wait 25 years for the fulfillment of this promise. And now, let's say 25 years later, he's now being asked to sacrifice the sign of his obedience, the gift that God was giving given to him. And he did so willingly. So again, you have an exterior sacrifice, which he's willing to do, because it's not an animal. It's not, oh, I can do that, it's an animal. It's my favorite animal, but it's just an animal. This is my only son, my beloved son. I'm going to sacrifice this because God has asked. So inside of Ab the Abraham's sacrifice, you have the exterior action of the sacrifice of Isaac, and you have the interior disposition that he's willing to lay down that which he loves most for that which he loves even more, who's the Lord. Uh, and so you have this profound uh, action in which the exterior and the interior are joined in almost perfect unity with Abraham. Now, what does this mean for us? Um, I had a, when I, I lived in a monastery for a year, and the, the, one of the priests in the monastery would often uh, tell us that um, don't um, the Lord does not want you to love the gift more than the giver. So when you feel blessing, when you feel consolation, when you feel like you're doing what the Lord wants you to do, and you feel this peace and, and, and joy and happiness, don't be surprised if all of that is robbed, taken from you. If somehow what you, what you think you should be doing is thwarted, if the goals you have don't come to fruition, if the dreams you have are, are laid waste, um, because what we do is we get attached to the gift and we forget the giver. And that's, that's, that's no bueno. Uh, that's no good. We, do not want, we don't want to get to the point of where we're, we're focused on the gift and we forget the, the, the giver. And we talked a little bit about this uh, uh, back in, in the summer when we talked about our prayer life. And sometimes we get so attached to the way we pray that suddenly we walk into it. It's like, this is, this is awful. Uh, it's, I'm dry. I feel nothing. And maybe because the Lord is, taking those, uh, is hiding himself, has pulled back the feelings of consolation to pur purify us, to make sure that we're really loving the Lord and not just loving the gift he's given us. And if that's the idea, it goes all the way back to Abraham, because that's what Abraham was called to do, was are you willing to sacrifice that, my gift to you, so that you can be focused on the giver? And Abraham certainly was, and that's when he was stopped. So he proved that he had this interior uh, sacrifice, uh, this interior heart that aligned with the exterior sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's just a translation. Yeah, yeah. I know, but it's like, it said, first it says the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am, I'm assuming that's Abraham. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to harm him or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, which is also confusing to me too. That's the angel. That's the angel speaking. That's the angel, but then yeah. you Okay, it says, who am I? I, I 
I read it as being God. Seeing that you not withheld... Now the angel is still talking. Son. Angel is talking on behalf of God. Your only son from me. Yeah. So that's the angel? Yeah. Yeah, the angel is talking on behalf of... It, it's, it's not as... It is, it's not as uh, clear, I, I'm sure a, a modern editor would sit there and say, do this, do that, but also I don't know what the, the original Hebrew is, this is the translation, so you never really know uh, how it's supposed to be. Um, um, and I chose this translation because this is the one I'm familiar with the most, uh, which means I've read it enough, uh, so I know kind of what's going to happen, um, and so it's just easier for me to teach from something that I actually are familiar with. I've used translations, like new translations I've never used in teaching. I'm fumbling over words. Like what I think is supposed to be there is not there because it's a different, they've, they've ordered it differently and it kind of throws off my rhythm. So this is, got to maintain the rhythm. So this is what I chose. Um, but now we go to Moses. So what Bishop Barron does, he starts from, uh, he goes with Abraham. Now he goes to Moses. And he points out in his book that Moses too, like Abraham, was called to an interior sacrifice. Um, he, ha- he, was, he, he had to spend 40 years in the desert and kind of sacrificing. According to a, a Hebraic tradition or, or, or Jewish tradition, he was raised in the court of Pharaoh. Uh, and he had all the riches given to him. He had the education of Pharaoh. And then uh, because he, he saw... Um, an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, he killed the Egyptian, then he feared that wasn't going to get discovered and that he might get arrested and, I guess, executed, because that would be the, the punishment for that crime. So he fled and has been 40 years out in the desert. And then the Lord calls him back um, through the burning bush to go back to uh, Egypt. And it wasn't easy for him. He had to suffer the obstinacy of Pharaoh, and he also had to suffer the obstinacy of the people he's supposed to be saving. So he's like, he's getting, he's getting no thanks no matter which way he looks, right? Pharaoh's upset with him, and so is everyone else. And he's like standing there. So he has to endure, you know, somewhat like Christ, the, the, um, the uh, tension, the enmity uh, with, between him and the government, him and the state, and the enmity between him and the people who don't appreciate what he's trying to do. And so he bears the weight of a, sacrifice, a sacrificial weight, and he continues down this road. And so Bishop Barron points out that, you know, and the other great founder of, of the Jewish religion, you had the father of it, but now you had the founder with Moses. Both of them had an interior element of, of a sacrificial heart. This is all going to resonate because what's, you know, with, with Jesus, but remember, what's the two ideas that we're going to be struggling with? that the primitive religion struggled with, that the Jews, we're about to see the Jews struggling with, is that between exterior actions and interior attitude. And the founders, what, what Bishop Barron's trying to point out, I think, is that the founders of Judaism, the father, Abraham, and the founder of the nation, Moses, both had an interior disposition that was reflected in the exterior actions. With me? Make sense? Okay. So then we get to Exodus 24. Now, we, he does touch upon the Passover. We're not going to cover the Passover because we already covered the Passover a couple weeks ago. But he touched upon uh, Exodus 24. This is when the, the covenant is being made. And we had this idea of sacrifice right here um, with uh, uh, or, or the nature of sacrifice, the nature of blood. Remember, blood is a symbol of life. Um, and so now we're going to read uh, Exodus 24. And he said to Moses, come up. To the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Those are the Ten Commandments, by the way. And, um, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And here we get to the key point. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins 
and half of the blood he threw against the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people, and said, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up. They went Mount Sinai. And they saw the God of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for, for clearness. And he did not lay his hands on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Okay, what's going on here? Well, we have the covenant ritual. Uh, oxen, the, the, the altar is a symbol of the presence of God and the people. Well, they're the people. And so you have the blood of the sacrifice. The blood is a sign of life. This is true for Israel as well as it was for all primitive religions, a sign of life. And so now you're taking the life, the, 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 the sign of life, and you're throwing part, he throws part of it upon the altar, and he throws the rest of it on the people, and now God and the people are all covered with the same blood. They are bound together in a covenant. It's a, a covenant is more than a contract. A contract would be like, you know, Norm comes up to me and says, I need someone to mow the lawn. I would say, there, go, go to my son. But let's say, you know, come in, mow the lawn. I'll give you 50 bucks to mow the lawn. I go mow the lawn. He gives me 50 bucks. We're done. Okay? If I don't mow the lawn, I don't get 50 bucks. If I mow the lawn, he doesn't give me 50 bucks. I'm not going to mow the lawn again. All right? It's, it's, that's what a contract is. It's an exchange of goods and services, and that's it. A covenant is a, cov is a relation. It's, it's, it's a sacred bond in which creates kinship between people, which is why we talk about marriage being a covenant. The two shall become one. A new reality, a new family is, is coming into being. Uh, it goes beyond simply a contract. And so what's happening here is a covenant is being established between God, Yahweh, and the people. And the sign of this covenant is that sacrifice. Remember, sacrifice, it brings about um, a form of Petition, a form of thanksgiving, a form of uh, reconciliation, a form of unity. All these ideas are being intertwined right here, and you have this joining of God with his people, a covenant reality. And then at the end of it, the, the elders go up the mountain, they see God, and they eat and drink. So after the sacrifice, they have a sacred meal. Uh, this, is, this is part of what we saw at the Passover. They killed the lamb. And then they ate it. I didn't talk about this too much, because if you go back to the primitive religions, part of offering, uh, if, you, if you sacrificed an animal on behalf of your own sins, part of that sacrificial action was eating the animal, taking it upon yourself. This idea of living vicariously or being joined somehow to that which is being sacrificed. And then we see this in, of course, the Eucharist with Christ. Um, so anyway, the Jews then build the temple uh, after they get to the promised land. And for a thousand, a thousand years, more or less, they have sacrifice. They sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. Uh, there was an estimate that at the time of Jesus, approximately 250,000 lambs were sacrificed every Passover. 250,000. Um, because you can only sacrifice in the temple, and apparently there was a drain, and the blood would go the, down that drain, and that they would, it, would, it, would, it would go through the, the, the sewer. I mean, it's not really a sewer, but through whatever, the aqueduct or whatever it's called. And um, I'm not an engineer by any stretch of the imagination. And it would eventually merge with another part uh, of what was underneath Jerusalem that carried water. And so the blood and the water would, would, would mix, and it would get... It would sh get shot out um, over the mountain, a mixture of blood and water from the side of the temple. What does that remind you of? Blood and water coming out of the temple. Christ, the side of Christ. Blood and water. So this is, that's a little bonus. Um, but yeah, that's how much sacrifice. 250,000 lambs every, every Passover. And that was just one, one of the feasts. So sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Lots of blood, lots of sacrifice. They did it for a thousand years. Well, what was the great problem? 
Remember the tension between exterior action and interior attitude. And so in this, what happened is that the exterior, um, the exterior action became more and more, and the, what got lighter and lighter and less and less was the interior attitude. So then we get to Isaiah. And this is what Isaiah is, one of, he was only one of, one of the prophets that talked about this. But we had this great passage from Isaiah, which Bishop Barron quotes, Isaiah chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. He's speaking to the Israelites, and he calling, he's calling them the rulers of Sodom. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin-infested cities that were, you know, the, the, the fire rained down and, and destroyed them. So he's not mixing, you know, he's not pulling any punches here. He's being very clear of what he thinks. Give ear to the teachings of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires you of this trampling in my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure in iniquity and solemn assembly. That's pretty profound. I can't endure the combination of iniquity or with a solemn assembly. Don't bring your sin together and think you're going to be able to worship, in other words. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. So here what's happening is that the Jews have become exterior practice focused, focused on the exterior, and they've neglected the interior attitudes. And this is going to be the, the problem. And if we go to Jeremiah, of course the question is, how do we fix this? This is the problem, right? This is the problem we all have. How do we fix this lack of interior uh, disposition, our interior attitude? So we go to Jeremiah, and we see that the fix, the solution, doesn't come from ourselves. It doesn't come from more sacrifice or better sacrifice. It comes from God himself. So Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by their hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to, their great, to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and they will remember my, their sin, and I will re remember their sin no more. So the solution to the interior problem comes from God himself. He's going to establish a new covenant, give us a new heart, take away the stony hearts, give us a, a, a spiritual heart so that we can embrace. And so our, our interior attitudes are now in alignment with our exterior actions of sacrifice, of worship. Okay. How is he going to do this? That's the great question, how? Well, Bishop Barron then brings us, calls attention to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52 through 53, this is the suffering servant. <clears throat> for the sake of brevity, or the sake of time, I'm looking at my watch, I'm not going to read this whole thing, because uh, I do want to get to the New Testament, and eventually the Eucharist, and some application. But I just want to, I, I have, I have um, for some reason, I decided today to put in italics the key, the key passages, or the key phrases from this passage, they're right there in the middle. Um, we've all heard these passages before. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid him and the, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then he dropped to the very last line. Yet he bore the sins of many and made intercession for their transgressions. So for the ancient Jews, especially for Isaiah, there would come a person who would himself be the sacrifice. That he would um, have this interior, like Abraham, like Moses, have an interior disposition to uh, sacrifice for the sake of God, but unlike Abraham and unlike Moses, his sacrifice wouldn't simply just be moving across country or sacrificing his only begotten son, his only beloved son, or sacrificing bulls and, and enduring the weight of, of Pharaoh and, and the people, but he would encompass all of that and then lay down his own life for the sake of bringing about this new covenant, this new reality. He himself would carry the, the sins of us Upon, uh, upon him, and then bring about that peace and reconciliation between us and God. So this is like the Old, the Old Testament. This is for, uh, for Bishop Barron, the big ideas of the Old Testament, the sacrifice of Abraham, both as the interior uh, from the move, the exterior with Isaac, and the interior with Isaac. You have the sacrifices of Moses. You have the call for the new interior covenant. You have the struggle between uh, exterior action on one hand and interior disposition on the other. And then you have the solution. The Lord himself will give us a new heart and he'll do this in some way by the suffering servant. And so this is what Bishop Barron's kind of pulling together because he's trying to bring us to Jesus Christ. And because Christ is the fulfillment of all of this. And so interestingly, he draws our attention to the baptism of Jesus. Not the first thing he talks about is the baptism of Jesus. And I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, I, I, I thought about the, the baptism of Jesus. I had some questions about it. But it wasn't until I began to read it for like the third or fourth time and, um, that I began to see just how much of the Old Testament is actually contained in the story of the baptism of Jesus. So let's start going through it. And I have two, there's, two, there's two episodes One's from Matthew, one's from John. So we'll start with Matthew. Then Jesus said, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a low, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, we've heard this story, I don't know how many times in our lives, in the Gospels. But suddenly, what should, what, what, I'm, I'm assuming, what's jumping out at you the way it jumped out at me? What passage? What phrase? This is my beloved son. Because suddenly, Abraham, the sacrifice of Abraham is in the background. Okay, we, and I never really saw that before. It's, it's there. This is my beloved son. The other thing Bishop Barron points out is the idea of righteousness. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. That has been a question that has plagued me for a long time. What does this mean, fulfill all righteousness? And I've read commentaries, and I've gotten some pretty good answers. And he offers a, a, another interesting, a really interesting answer, is that from, the, from a biblical, biblical perspective, to be made righteous is to be made right with God. Now, how did he begin his chapter on sacrifice? The way we become right with God is through sacrifice, because we live in a twisted, sinful reality. And that has to be twisted back into shape. It has to be reconfigured. And that way that happens is through sacrifice. So right here with this idea that Christ has come to make things right with God, which requires enormous effort, which requires sacrifice. So there's hints of that right there, that Christ himself has to sacrifice, or Christ has to sacrifice himself, and he's the only beloved son of, 
uh, of the Father. Now we go to the Gospel of John. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, he was before me, I myself did not know him. And then jump to the very last line of that paragraph, which is on page 4. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So here, and where did the Lamb of God come from? Who, who gave us the Lamb of God? Moses. Right? So, so right there in the baptism of Jesus, we, we see Bishop Barron start making some connections. We have the idea of sacrifice and righteousness. He's the son of the father, the only son, the only begotten son, the only beloved son. He's the lamb of God, so we have the idea of Moses there. Uh, and so all these themes are coming together in the baptism of Jesus. And it's a sign, the, very, I mean, his, the beginning of his public ministry is basically a declaration that he has come to be the sacrificial lamb, the suffering servant, the one who would bear our iniquities upon him. And we don't have time to go into all of it, and I guess I anticipated it because I only have some summary notes. Um, but we go, think about the temptation in the desert. So he goes out into the desert, and he fasts for 40 days, and then he gets tempted with food. He gets tempted to, to display his power. He gets tempted to, to, to have the, all the things of the world at his weakest point. Because after you don't eat for 40 days, you're pretty... You're, you're pretty Hangry, I would suspect. You're pretty, you're pretty anxious. Uh, and so he, he gets tempted. And Bishop Barron says something really interesting. If he just kind of withstood these temptations from afar, it wouldn't mean too much. But rather by walking into it, he feels the weight and the brunt of that temptation. And it's only in taking it upon himself and overcoming it does he defeat it. It's kind of a really profound idea. It's only when we take the temptation upon ourselves can we defeat it. So I was thinking about how do I, what's the analogy here? So the analogy I came up with was the reason why we don't have Oreos in our house. Okay? Because I have yet to defeat that temptation. So Oreos come into our house, and when the, it's not so much nowadays because I really don't like them anymore, but... 15 years ago, when the kids were younger, oh, we want Oreos. They were not going to have any Oreos in the house. And they would beg me. We were at Target. I get the Oreos. They come home. They each get two. I put them, you know, go to nap time. They come back. We have some Oreos. Oh, they're gone. All right? They're, they are gone. And they'd be so upset because I couldn't resist them. And so it was easier to have to resist from afar by not even buying them. All right? And we all know this, right? If we don't want to consume something that we like, we keep it out of the house. It's when it's in our house, right there, present, do we feel the full weight of that temptation? It calls you. What? It calls you. it calls you. You can hear it beckoning. That's right. You can hear it. No doubt. No, I'm best with milk. I'm milk's favorite cookie. Come and eat me. Yes. Well, take that and now put yourself in the idea of Jesus. This is what's going on. He has put himself in a state of weakness and then invited all that temptation to wash over him and he withstood it. And that's how he defeated it. And then, so he had to suffer. He had to sacrifice. He had to give up all his, his, his whatever uh, the human desire he had for food, for power, for things, in order to defeat it. And that was just magnified even further on the cross. Because he not just resisted and let uh, all, the, all the temptations come over him, he also stood and allowed all the consequences of sin to be washed over him in the rejection of his apostles or the, the, the abandonment of his apostles, the denial of Peter, the betrayal of Judas, the rejection by the scribes and the Pharisees, the people who uh, were calling him hail, you know, king of the Jews, Hosanna in the highest on Palm Sunday were now saying crucify him, crucify him on Good Friday. All of that he endured in silence. He endured every whip, whipping, every chastisement, every beating, every spit, uh, spittle that came his way. He had to carry the cross, and he did it all in silence. And he's God. At any point in time, he could have said, I'm done with this. And you know, as Pilate said to him, don't you know I had the power to release you? What did Jesus say? That's right. No, he said, no, you don't have any power. 
Because of that which was given to you, I could call legions of angels if I wanted to. But he withstood it. And, with, with, and he, he totally allowed exactly what the prophet Isaiah said. He carried all the transgressions, all our iniquities upon him, all the way to the point of death. And in doing so, he conquered it all. It became the sacrifice. And because he's God, that it wasn't simply a sacrifice of one man in a symbolic gesture. It was a true sacrifice that brings about a real reconciliation with us. Everything else, going back to the primitive religions, when they sacrificed the, the brain or the heart, or whatever they did, or they cut open their knee for the blood, or all the lambs, or everything that, that was done all throughout the, 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 the ancient Hebrews, those were all symbolic ways of trying to show that we were trying to reconfigure ourselves so that we could be right with God. And now you have the one who was obedient the way Abraham was, the way I, uh, Abraham, uh, Moses was, but as the Apostle Paul tells us, he was obedient unto death. And it's through his unto death that then he was raised to the glory and that that sacrifice becomes the sacrifice which brings about the redemption of the world. That brings about our own redemption. Let me finish my train of thought, then i get to questions. Is that okay? Yeah, nope. Yeah, hey, what's your question? <laughs> he is God, the, the God-man. He's the, in, the incarnate God. So everything he did, he did as God and he did as man. Only if he let himself. Only if he let himself. This is the mystery. He, he, as St. Paul tells us, I don't have a Bible with me, but as St. Paul tells us in Philippians, uh, though he was in the form of God, he did not deem himself equal with God, something to be grasped at. So this idea of something to be grasped at, in the Greek that means like something a robber or an animal would, would try to grab. So he was in the form of God, so he, so he humbled himself, becoming the form of a slave. So this is called, the, well, it's, in Greek it's called the kenosis. He emptied himself out so that he could live this life. And he allowed all of that to happen to him. The best I can give you right now, before we go on to other stuff, but that's what you have to accept, is that he allowed it all to happen to him. For the sake of it. In fact, Bishop Barron says, the, the great... That what made the son's sacrifice so beautiful and pleasing to the father was not the exterior physical reality of flesh, I mean, a body on cross and blood, but it was the fact that as the obedient son, he left the glory of heaven, came down to live in the muck of the world, and took upon himself, allowed himself to be washed over and embraced as in all his all he could, all the sins of the world, and allow himself to be obedient to this mission to the point of death, it was a complete and total sacrificial heart. And that's what made the action because it was complete and total obedience to the Father, in a way that Abraham and Moses simply reflected upon. He is the obedient one. And it's through his obedience that brings about the redemption of the world. And so it was a complete, you know, his, his, uh, his becoming in the form of the slave also means that he somehow, in a way which is, in one sense, incomprehensible to us, he was able to empty himself of all his divinity, even though he remained God in this process. Um, but we have to say that Jesus is God, because if he's not God, then that is a nice gesture by a very stupid man, as it really comes down to. Because, you know, he thinks he's God. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Actually, we talked about this uh, in RCIA. I'm the resurrection, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't believe in me, um, you have no life within you. I mean, people, pe people who are not God don't say those things unless they are insane or else they're trying to lie. 
But this is a different question about, you know, the idea of Jesus, is Jesus the liar, the lunatic, or the Lord? This is the great question uh, that C.S. Lewis asked. And so he's neither a liar nor he's a lunatic, so therefore he has to be the Lord. And he has to be who he said he is. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, that means he is the resurrection and the life. And it was proven by his, his own resurrection. But this is not necessarily something to get into right now, because I do want to move on to the idea of the Eucharist of sacrifice, uh, because that's really what it comes about. So if we believe that the Eucharist is the continuation of it's Jesus Christ himself, and that it's not... Well, let me just read it and let's talk about it. Let me read that passage from, from, from 1 Corinthians. Um, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the first idea is the idea of the new covenant. That phrase is not something the apostles or the gospel writers or St. Paul used because there was something old and now there's something new. It was a hearkening back to what Jeremiah said. In the last days, I will establish a new covenant with you. And in the new covenant, I will give you a new heart, a one that is obedient, one that is, that is the interior attitudes are now directed toward me in the right way, not a heart of stone. Go back, exterior attitude, with uh, exterior practice with interior attitude. What the Lord wants is the interior change because we're sinful. That's what he wants is the... To, to, to straighten us out, that loop of grace we talked about, that my obedience means it opens up grace for me to become more righteous, more in line with him, more in communion with him. There's no sacrifice. There's no communion without sacrifice, is what Bishop Barron says over and over again. There's no table without an altar. <coughs> so you have this idea of the new covenant, and you also have the idea of remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. That, the, um, that whatever you do brings about, uh, and the idea of memory here has nothing to do with, oh, this is a good thing to reflect upon, like on the 4th of July, where we just kind of remember what happened. Um, and in fact, for what we mean and what we believe is that the Mass itself is a remembrance, and it's through rem- remembering that the reality becomes present. That the Mass is a representation of what happened on Calvary. That when we go to Mass, we are present at Calvary in some mystical way, or, to put it a different direction, that Calvary is made present to us in some mystical way. And the only way this is possible is because what happened at Calvary was done by the God-man, a man who was also God. Therefore, his actions are historical actions, but they're also eternal actions. They they exist outside of time and therefore can be applied at any point in time in as many places as at once. So every Mass, then, is a representation or a bringing forth, a calling forth, however word you want to use, a remembrance of the sacrifice of Calvary, the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary, and we are somehow, in a mystical way, present there, a sacramental way we're present there. In fact, that's probably a more accurate way of saying that we're sacramentally present at Calvary during Mass. The same way that when we go before the Eucharist, we are present, where you know, Christ is sacramentally present to us in the Eucharist. That this reality, is, it goes beyond simply the, the appearance of just symbol and action. Um, there's, a, there's an interior reality that's there. Does that all make kind of what we're getting at here? Okay. So what does this mean practically for us? So we have the idea of sacrifice. We've gone through that. We've gone through the Old Testament sacrifice. We touched a little bit upon the life of Christ and the sacrifice and how that all culminates in the Mass because we had time. We could bring in, you know, Abraham and Isaac, I mean, Abraham and Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah all intertwined it with the Mass. We don't have time for all of that. So I, wanted, I was thinking about how do I want to end this, and it has to end in some kind of practical way. How do we make the Mass our own sacrifice? Or, perhaps there's another way to put it, how do we enter into the sacrificial reality of the Mass? 
When we come to Mass, it's, it's easy. I come to Mass, I receive communion. I'm in communion with God, communion with each other. I get that. Or I come to Mass, there's the Eucharist, that's truly Jesus, I'm in the presence of Christ. But how do I embrace the sacrificial element of the Mass, the sacrificial dimension of the Mass? And I can think of no better way to end it, because Bishop Aaron himself answers the question on page 67 to 68. <clears throat> I think this is a good way to kind of read and then um, slowly and then reflect upon. The Vatican II document on the church, Lumen Gentium, says that every baptized person is a priest. That is to say, someone capable of entering into the sacrificial dynamic of the liturgy. This is the common priesthood that is given to all of us at baptism. That's what he's talking about. Through the ordained priest alone, I mean, sorry, though the ordained priest alone can preside at the Mass and affect the Eucharistic change, all of the baptized participate in the Mass in a priestly way. They do this through their prayers and responses, but also, the document specifies, by uniting their personal sacrifices and sufferings to the great sacrifice of Christ. So a father witnesses the agony of his son in the hospital. A mother endures the rebellion of a teenage daughter. A young man receives news of his brother's death in battle. An elderly man tosses on his bed in anxiety as he contemplates his unsure financial situation. A graduate student struggles to complete his doctoral thesis. A child experiences for the first time the breakup of a close friendship. An idealist confronts the stubborn resistance of a cynical opponent. These people could see their pain as simply dumb suffering, the off scourgings of an indifferent universe. Or they could see it through the lens provided by the sacrificial death of Jesus appreciating it as the means by which God is drawing them closer to himself. Suffering, once joined to the cross of Jesus, can become a vehicle for the reformation of the sinful self, the turning of the soul in the direction of love. Mind you, I am not suggesting a simplistic, causal correlation between sin and suffering. Indeed, the book of Job rules out such a move. But I am suggesting that pain consciously aligned to the sacrifice of Jesus, can be spiritually transfiguring. Thus, the sufferer becomes not simply a person in pain, but Abraham giving away what he loves the most, Moses enduring the long discipline of the desert, David confronting Goliath and being pursued by Saul, or the crucified Messiah wondering why he has been forsaken by the Father. The place where this alignment happens is a liturgy, for the liturgy, liturgy is the representation of the, sacrifice, of the sacrifice of the Lord in all of its richness and multi, multivalence. Consequently, those who gather with intentionality and focus at the altar of Jesus are not simply witnessing the event of the cross, they are sharing in it. And this participation changes fundamentally the manner in which they experience and interpret their own pain. And thus we can see finally and fully the intimate link between the meal and the sacrifice aspects of the Eucharist. Only in the measure that we are transformed through sacrifice, only when our sin and suffering have been dealt with, can we sit down in the fellowship of the sacred banquet. And thus we have come full circle. The Eucharistic liturgy is the sacred meal because it is a sacrificial offering. In the blood of Jesus, the bliss of the Eden is restored, and God and human beings are once again friends. I mean, it's an incredible piece of writing. So you're all Catholics here, and so you all heard the phrase, just offer it up, right? That's, we've all heard that. This is where it comes from. The idea that we offer it up in participation with Christ, in, particip in participation with Christ. I used to wonder what that meant, because I heard it too, Gordon, just offer it up, just offer it up. 
No, I just wanted to stop. That's what I want. I don't want to offer it up. I want to, I want, I want to stop. And so I, I didn't know what it meant. You know, what does this mean? And um, it wasn't until, I mean, I hadn't read this book, right? This was years ago when I was, I was asking this question. I was reading um, a book by Tom, William Thomas Walsh, um, old Catholic writer, on St. Teresa of Avila. And St. Teresa of Avila's father apparently had a grave shoulder uh, uh, injury, lots of shoulder pain, and um, when she was writing about this, St. Teresa of Avila said, well, I suppose the Lord wants him to, to participate in the shoulder pain he suffered when he was crucified. And I was blown away by that statement. I was like, what does that mean? You know, so I really thought about it, and I began to see this is what, this is what is being meant is that whatever pain we suffer, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, can somehow be aligned with, joined with, in union with the pain of Christ during his agony. Um, whether it's a shoulder pain or pain in your side or a headache, right, or feeling abandoned by someone or betrayed by someone, Christ experienced it all. The depression of being like you, you feel left, uh, forgotten by God, He's, he's, he's endured it. He's had all those experiences, emotional, physical, spiritual. And so we can unite ourselves to that. And what, Bishop, what, the, the, what is new, I guess, in my thought process, is that all this comes to a culmination or a fine point within the context of the liturgy. Because the liturgy is the sacrifice of Christ made present to us. And so when I bring that pain and suffering, whatever it might be, into Mass and consciously offer it up in union with his own sacrifice, there's a real power there for transformation because the one to whom I'm trying to unite myself to, I am united with when I receive communion. And so his sacrifice becomes mine and my sacrifice becomes his and now there's a real partnership between me and him and you and him and us and, and all of us as we try to walk together and, and become reconfigure ourselves from this twisted state of sin to a state of union with God and therefore union with one another. So that's what the, 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 the mass of the sacrifice is all about. It's getting us into this reality that, that everything that every, every suffering that we endure, if we accept it as the will of God, can be transformed into something that brings about a real spiritual transformation within us. Any comments or questions? A lot to ponder. It's heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. Just one thing. And this is just something you mentioned about the shoulder pain. Uh huh. And ever since you said it, I've been trying to, I just read this within the last few weeks, and I can't remember who it was about, but it was a visionary. And one of the visits, he was told, or she was told, of the sufferings of Christ, mm -hmm. that the most painful was part for him was the shoulder pain John Paul, from carrying, John, who was it? It John was John Paul, Paul the second, John, told me to Padre Pio, because he had to see Pio, that. Yeah, he and asked those two. him what That's was the right, most painful. That's right, that was the greatest suffering. Was yeah, the from that, everything was dislocated uh -huh. and torn apart inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, really, it was worse than the cross. Thank you. I yeah. just read that a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Yeah. I think it goes beyond Padre Pio, though. And the reason why I say that uh, is because um, I don't know the saint. It's, I think it's St. Bridget of Sweden, I think, is who it was. Who has the, the prayers so that the sacred heart, the... the, the, the um, Margaret Mary. Margaret Mary Alico, yeah. the sacred heart. Um, there's one of them. Anyway... My point is this. When Mel Gibson made the Passion of the Christ, mm -hmm. he prayed a litany to the Passion. It was either from St. Bridget of Sweden or St. Mary. It was Catherine Ann Emmerich that he used as... So there's a, there's a number of visionaries that have seen it, but if you, watch, if you watch the Passion of the Christ, mm -hmm. he does emphasize the dislocated shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, 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 I, it caught my attention because I knew... I knew from what St. Teresa had said, there, there, there has been that um, devotion in the church for the wounded shoulder of Christ that goes back hundreds of years. 
Um, I think with Padre Pio, though, I think that was the wound he never talked about. Yes, that's exactly and right. And he, he did tell, he did but tell. There wasn't anything visible. No. The other ones were visible. Okay, is that it? Yeah, I don't know, all the, I don't know a lot about Padre Pio. Um, anyway, but yeah, so there's this idea. But what it comes down to, kind of bring it back, is, is to bring about that um, sense of uniting our own sufferings with Christ. And it does, it's transformative. Um, all the spiritual writers say, you know, when it comes to like, you know, idea of fasting, mortification, giving things up, the greatest mortifications we can do, the greatest sense of the sacrifices we can make is to humbly accept and embrace the crosses the Lord gives us on a day-to-day basis. It's so much easier, I'm going to do it this way. Yeah, I like this better than that. But what the Lord gives us to suffer is well, exactly what we need. And we just have to embrace it. Um, anyway. Okay, let's end with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.